Uh, yeah, nice to see you all. So I'm the last guy standing between you, between you and the lunch, so I'll try to be short. Uh, basically, the main idea is really simple. I mean, I come from a bit different world, and I, we, we as a company also, we differ from most of the guys here. There are two major differences for us. One of them is we don't really come from academic background. We actually come from business background and software development and these kind of things. And so I'm, no, I'm not a scientist, I'm, so don't ask me scientific questions. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll can, you know, tell something which is not really supposed to be said. Uh, and the second one, we come from really physical world. We come from the world of uh, trucks, trains, and things going around. So the problem for us which we have to solve is we have to do the full cycle. We have to do the stuff about gathering the data, and we have to do the processing of the data. And the main idea which I want to tell you today is our two stories on how did we get from the one side into the deep learning and why, why are we here at the moment. I'll try to tell two stories, if we run out of time, then I'll stick to one only, okay? So, um, the history we had actually was fairly simple. Back in 2010, we were approached by a customer of ours, which was a railroad company, which said, you know, we want to solve a simple problem. We have these trains passing through our, uh, coming into our uh, jurisdiction, basically. And so we have to identify them, and there are many issues with them. So the problem they had, they had the three, uh, basically three shifts of people <laughs> working 24-7. The train, when it had to come in, basically it had to stop. And you know, the guys were with walkie-talkies walking down by the train and saying, hey, this actually is the wrong sequence. There is no number over there. There are many other issues with the train which are possible. So we started off with a very simple quest, for most of you probably, which is number recognition, right? The only difference was at the time being that the numbers we had to deal with were not the numbers in European trains. Just to give you some of the examples basically, right? This is what we started off. I'll just jump ahead a little bit. So these are some of the examples we had. I mean, some of them are very easy, comparatively. Uh, some of them are actually turned out to be really nasty for any type of algorithms we try to throw at them. Like being them neural network algorithms, something else. I'm always thinking about actually, you know, giving a prize to the guy who can tell me what kind of actual number is on this wagon, for example, right? So, I always had a feeling, you know, that people were actually, you know, when drawing the numbers, they didn't use any, like, trap frets on them, and they probably also were drunk or something. So, you know, we had different issues like this. And we had a formal request at the time. We had a formal request of fulfilling actually 95% of recognition, including all this, what you see, what you just saw over there, okay? So, the images we used initially, and this, this also was one of the sources, you know, we always like to talk about failures we, we have had, right? And this is one of the failures we had actually for one and a half years. So, one of the failures, I'll just go back a little bit, was based on the fact also that we were also using really bad input. And the bad input was, for example, this one, which is uh, very low resolution cameras, 320 by, 20, by 240 and basically stitching the images together, right? So we got different kind of interesting issues. So all the hardware, whatever else, time, lo losing the frames, and whatever else could happen, basically. So many things over there. So from our perspective, we were basically forced to go into a bit different direction. And from our perspective, we were forced to figure out some better way to do this. And we, so this is how we more or less end up into deep learning, okay? So, what we thought at the time? We thought at the time that there has to be more than one input. There has to be more than, you know, just an image from which we have to extract the number. So, we, okay, we said, first of all, let's try to identify the type. We're talking about hundreds of types of different wagons. Some of them have major differences, like containers on a platform and versus cistern. And some of them actually, or tanker, and some of them actually have very small differences. Like there are 80 types of oil tankers, basically, which can be on, its, on railroad. And, you know, there's very minor differences between some of them. So there are quite a few issues over there. The good news is, at the time, we had actually three types of inputs. So we didn't use only images. So when we started thinking about different approach, and we, when we started using actually the deep learning stuff, we had actually not just the images. One of them was the LIDAR-based system, so it's called LMS here, but basically we call it laser management system. The main idea, it was doing 3D profiling of the trains as well. So we actually got three-dimensional images which were sliced, depending on speed, but still we got some kind of image of a train, which could also was one part of the input. Second was, was different kind of sensors, which were, which were doing for the guys as well. Sensors gave us the result of basically give, giving us the ability to see the length of the train, to see where the axles are versus the speed, so we could actually calculate how long the wagon is. And there are major differences also in length as well, in some cases. And the third one was actually this one, was the images. So, uh, 
basically, we, we combine these three things together, and this is what we got in the end of the day, right? So we got basically a result which was more or less expected, but the funny thing for us was actually that it turned out to be much more useful for our customers than we initially thought. When we talked to them and said, hey, you know, this is how we got to the result, they said, yes, but can you do something more for us if you are doing these kind of things? Okay, and then we started talking to them what would be the next things they would be willing to see, right? So, uh, yeah, so this is the Northern Talks part. So moving ahead, one of the things which we, they wanted to see and which they actually wanted to do to replace the human labor with was basically they wanted to see if there are seals on the train. Right? The seal is a small yellow thing over there, basically, if you, you can see over there. So you have to identify the type of train or wagon. And then based on this, when you have to see if there is actually seal over there. For, for tankers, it's on top. For different kind of wagons, it's on the side. There are different kind of open doors and all the other things. So this is what we had to train our network for to be able, up from the second phase, after identifying the type, it had to be able actually to see if there is a seal, if there is supposed to be a seal on that. And another thing which was over there was which another th job which uh, they were doing, which was actually uh, looking for stuff like, for example, graffiti. Because it turns out the graffiti can be a huge problem for railroads because you don't see the numbers, the different kind of markings over there. So they have to mark it. And actually, you know, still the humans had to go there and mark them. So that was another issue. So we had to identify, you know, the normality of the wagon. So first of all, we get the type, and then we feed it into the network, and we see if it actually fits the description of normal wagon. And there can be many differences. There can be issues with the graffiti. There can be issues with uh, dirty wagons. Like if you pour an oil into the wagon, I mean, a lot of stuff, black stuff, which is going around. Some of the wagons are black themselves. So basically, we ended up replacing the part of the human labor for the customers, which was meant to be saying, this is OK versus this is not okay. Okay, so this was basically what we had. Um, so the question basically is how far did we get? So to answer on this one, on the first story, we didn't get to a point where we, cannot, where we should not stop the trains at all. The problem is that there are seals, have small numbers on them in some cases, and these unfortunately cannot be read by, because they just can be turned inside out, so they can be on the inside of the train. But there are certain things which you managed to do, basically, right? So we managed to identify the wagon types, which turned out to be useful. We managed to identify uh, stuff like number locations based on the types because they differ a little bit, which majorly increased for us the precision we were getting, actually, from this information. Seal locations, existence of seals, processing speed was another, th another issue which we had initially because it took around a minute to process a wagon. Now we are down to, actually, just a few seconds over there, which is reasonable. So. Uh, hatches, open hatches was another issue. Some of the wagons, when they're unloaded, they have the hatches on below, right? So you have to check if it's, if, the, it's, uh, if it's open or if it's closed. So this is also a definition of normality, which we had for that one. We haven't sol solved all the issues. So we still, have, but, but we, we still have some things like, as I said, the seals. We still have some things, you know, sometimes the guys walking down there, they have a huge hammer and they're hitting on the wagons to see if there is something on the wheel set, right? But anyway, so we have reduced the amount of people, which is another thing, which if you look from the result perspective, from 12 to being on site, for example, per, per, per installation, to three people on site. We have increased the speed of processing from one and a half hour, basically, to five minutes, approximately. And this we could not have done, basically, without using deep learning, without feeding into the uh, network's information, without training the networks. There are some other good news which you have managed to do for us, basically. We can manage to make a deal with the customer that they feed, uh, they change the way the operators work, right? Before this, the guy was looking at the train and saying, hey, there is a problem, that's it. Now what they're doing, they actually are processing. They're saying, the problem is graffiti over here, or, you know, the number like we saw on some of the slides over there, or some other open, open hatch over there, right? And based on this information, we get more than 1,000 images per day processed coming back from our customers which we then reuse to train again the network and to improve the results in the future. So this is one of the things how we use it, basically. That's a fairly simple idea over there. And this actually helps both. It helps us from one side, and it also helps our customers. So it's not just about us in this perspective. Okay. So I still have some time, so I'll just shortly run through the story number two in this perspective as well. So we had a, an idea in the markets where we're working with, basically, that uh, you know we can do we can help with the replacing human labor into images. 
So we had a couple of municipalities coming to us, actually it was one initially, which said, hey, we have an issue. Each summer we are gathering 20 people for a week who are going out on the streets, and what they're doing, they're counting cyclists. Okay? So they're trying to identify, for example, how many people are riding by with a bicycle. They say, hey, yes, we can buy, you know, very sophisticated solutions for tens of thousands of dollars, or euros, whatever, or pounds. But we would like, actually, you know, to make a simple solution. We have camera with that. So if we put somebody by the screen, he should be able to do this. Can your technology do this? Of course, initially, we thought, yeah, why not? I mean, that should be easy, right? Never was, as you can imagine. A uh, couple of issues we had, basically, were also technology-based. So we had two types of mistakes, two types of errors. One of them was because of technology, because we were getting still frames. And, uh, and these frames meant if somebody stopped there, so we had to know that this is still the same bicycle which hasn't left the frame, even if some of the frames went missing in the middle, right? I'll just show some of the examples we had, right? So while we're training the network, I mean, this is one of them, right? It doesn't look like a bicycle, to me at least, probably not to you as well. Uh, this one, the question is, how do we count it? <laughs> um, as you can see, the, uh, the algorithm actually has accidentally managed to count it more or less correctly. It says there are two bicycles in the image. But as you can see by the place where it has counted, right, it probably has not really the, actually what we intended for that to do. Okay. This one, sure, I mean, yeah, looks like one bicycle. Not really, if you look at this. This one doesn't look like a bicycle at all, at least not to me. <laughs> but... Okay, so it counts. And we actually had a really ra large issue with the garbage can over there. I don't know why. <laughs> maybe there was an issue when we were training the system and maybe somebody made a mistake over there. But initially we had a huge issue because the system just kept saying, this garbage can actually is a bicycle, right? <laughs> In the end of the day, of course, we got it to a level and we have, I don't have the pictures here, but we were, as the cameras were changing locations all the time, uh, we got it to a level where basically, you know, there's a, there, when there's a bicycle road, there is a marking on the road where there's a bicycle, you know, and system is constantly counting this as a bicycle. <laughs> but it is a bicycle, right? So there are issues like this. So we had to solve this as well. Yeah, now this is a famous garbage can, which was always taken into a bicycle count as well. Okay. So, um, so many issues were over there. I mean, this, this task we took up actually only two months ago. So we have managed to get the training up to a level. It still requires quite a lot of input from our side as well on manually, on manually working with the images to improve the network, to, to, to work with it all the time, basically. But I mean, we're getting, we're getting somewhere to make it simple and accessible. Um, yeah, so the question, of course, would be from this perspective, so where next? Um, yeah, this is the ideal perspective, as you can see. I mean, we see what we have over there. But um, to be honest, I mean, we work in a very narrow niche. We work in a niche where we have uh, very specific problems which we have to solve. Yes, we do apply deep learning to these problems at the moment. We do get better over time. There's a certain level which we at least see which we cannot uh, get better than, I mean, still. The question before there was a question in the audience about, you know, can, it, can the artificial intelligence or deep learning algorithms get better than 95% right, of, uh, for recognition in different kinds of cases? For our case, yes, they can, because they're very strictly applied to very specific areas, okay? Not always, and there are always going to be other issues like this as well, which you have to solve, okay? For this as well, now we have a next issue, right? It's, you know, there's a saying, if you give little finger to the devil, it will take all hand. So the municipality now says, you know, there is an issue we have, which is uh, we want to know how many cyclists are riding with helmets on. Because <laughs> we have a presumption that cyclists with helmets on are more aggressive than the cyclists without helmets, you know, because they feel safer, which I never heard about before, but okay. Then they want to know how many bicycles have child seats in the back. Do they have, ch ch do they have child in the child seat, right? So you get further and further, right? As I said, you give the little finger and it takes all hand and takes all of you, basically. So this is one of the things which we are fighting about as well at the moment. So this is, we don't, we haven't trained it yet, but hopefully even within um, two months, we have sufficient amount of data so we can actually train it. We don't have enough data yet because there are not that many people available at the moment, you know, with the, um, for the helmet it's okay, but I mean, especially with the, the child seats in the back, I mean, that's a bit different issue we have over there, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is one of the other things over there. Uh, from my perspective, as I said, I mean, there can be, uh, there are some issues which we can do. 
we do a lot of pre-processing, and as you can see, we use not only image data if it's possible. And this is actually the solution for us to make the algorithms work, to make it work for the way we intended them to be, actually. So not just images. That's one of the things which, for, which is there for us. In some areas, in some applications, the deep learning part is a bit too general. So we had to do some other mathematical models where we have to do some other comparisons to get the data out first and then feed it back into the model. So this is one of the things we also have to deal with. And a lot of things we have to do actually is, uh, is about getting the data because, I mean, we have to f manage the full cycle. We don't have a database of data which we can reuse to train the algorithm. We have to gather it ourselves and we have to <laughs> deal with it. But we do this together with our customers, which kind of helps. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Um, that was a really interesting talk, thanks. Um, you mentioned that in the bicycling example, you started by taking still images. Um, and I thought you were going to say, then we switched to uh, you know, video and it got a lot better. So uh, what's the status of the video? Yeah, uh, the problem is that with the infrastructure we have at the moment, we can't really switch to a video. We are investigating this at the moment. We are trying to build a prototype based on Raspberry Pi or whatever else which would be able to do this stuff for us, but then we have to do the, but it's not powerful enough for us to get the processing done in, 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 in the amount of time we allocate for this. So we are cheating a little bit at the moment with the images. We try to see if actually we can do pre-processing of video locally and then following, tracking the object through the image. So where does it move? And then only based on this information, feed it back into the, uh, into the system about the movement and other things. So it's a, now it's a bit of combination. Now we have a short-term video where we do tracking, and then from the tracking, we just extract one image, and then we feed that back into the system to do the recognition. You have a real-time real problem? We have actually, yeah, we have a processing problem because the, the customers want this to be very cheap and very easy to use and maintain on site, right? If we would have a connection over there, which we don't really have, which is jumping between 3G and LT. LT is nice, but 3G is like quite often it, jump, it drops down. So we have to some, have something on site to do the processing. And that has to be really cheap because there's already a camera they paid for, so they don't, they don't want to add anything very expensive over there. So this is the issue. You know, we have to balance between those two things. Thanks. Hi. Uh, what do you mean by very cheap? Okay. Is, it, is it into the uh, tens of euros or hundreds of euros? Just to get an idea of uh, how much you can spend on hardware. Yeah, uh, from our perspective, I mean, usually it's in the level of around 100 to 200 euros, right? So this is uh, the, the hardware we're ready to, to, to use over there. We have different kind of examples. We have played with NVIDIA Jetson. Right, as one of the options, but then we have some issues as we need for some operations, we need CPU and not just GPU. CPU is a bit not powerful enough for us. So there was, I talked to the guys from NVIDIA and there's a promise that it's gonna be more powerful Jetson in December. So we're gonna <laughs> test that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is one of the issues, right? And. Uh, <laughs>